hey, good morning. Glad to have all of you here. Glad to be with you speaking again this week. We just started last week a new message series called The Greatest Stories Ever Told. What we're doing is we're just taking a, a, a chunk of some weeks and we're looking at the stories, that the primary way that Jesus communicated truth about his kingdom, uh, communicated meaning about what it meant to follow him, about who God is, all of those things. I mean, sometimes we, we get caught up in the minutia of doctrinal application, in the, in the idioms of language and culture. And in doing so, we overlook the huge reality that Jesus, God in the flesh, largely chose to communicate his theology, his instruction, through two main things. Number one, how he lived his life. But when he did use words to communicate, number two, he used parables. Now, don't get this wrong. He didn't use parables as these little niceties for simple folk so that we could have flannel graph illustrations in 1970s Sunday school, okay? For Jesus, parables were his theology. They were the meaning. So many divisive church issues today were never addressed by Jesus. But things like mercy and forgiveness and self-righteousness, they were addressed quite a bit by Jesus in his parable. So what do you say, church? Have we got those mastered? So we're spending some time looking at some of Jesus' parables over the, in this series over the next few weeks. Last week, David talked about the parable of the unmerciful servant, if you remember that. The servant that owed his master like a million dollars and was forgiven the entire debt because he pleaded for mercy. And then he walks away right after being forgiven and finds someone who works under him that owes him like five bucks. The guy pleads, and he, and he just flips out. No way I'm forgiving you, and he throws him, and he hasn't prosecuted for it. We got a clear lesson last week on the importance of mercy, on, on forgiving much, because we have been forgiven much. It's a great reminder in our current culture where we seem so quick to get offended, to feel wronged. And last week, we got a healthy, healthy dose of Jesus' perspective to get our focus off ourselves and onto showing his mercy, his forgiveness, his endless compassion to the hurting world around us. Now this week, it kind of tags off that reality a little bit because each of us is that servant that has been forgiven much, has been forgiven a huge debt. And our own sin, our own faults, our own messes and struggles, we are that servant. To talk about that side of things is kind of a sobering reality for us, that huge debt that we've been forgiven. But the reality is, here at North Hills Christian Church, we are a place where nobody is perfect, where we are a collective of mess-ups. It's who we are. There's kind of a sting to that, though, right? We never like to be reminded of the ways that we don't measure up. It's a human thing. Ways that we've missed the mark. Every once in a while, I'll be at, at a place or some kind of environment where I know that everybody there is better at something than me. Have you ever been there? You're, you're very, very clearly reminded of how you don't measure up. I remember um, a high school youth group skiing trip. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the kid that grew up in the city, and I'm attending a church of largely rural agricultural families. Okay, It was a wonderful church. This was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We went on a, we went on a skiing trip somewhere in the Adirondacks of New York. I had never been skiing. I had never strapped on a pair of skis. I used to skateboard back in like seventh grade, but that was about it, okay? Now, I didn't shell out the extra money for the little lessons and how, learning how to snow plow, however you do that. I had, a, I had an image to uphold, right? I'm the city kid. I, I, I knew this stuff. I knew how to live life. I knew, I, <laughs> that was my image. I mean, what would it look like if this lively dude with the crazy hair and the loud clothes got all sullen and quiet and admitted he knew nothing about skiing. I had an image to uphold. Well, plus there were girls I wanted to impress, unfortunately. So I figured I, I was going to do this in style, okay? My whole idea was that I would do this in a way that was consistent with my identity or my personality. So we took off up the first hill, and I would go down in a blazing torrent. That was my idea. I'd fly past everyone and then land in that big pile of cushy snow at the end. I would be like a thrill seeker, the skydiver. I had this all planned out. I'd make everyone ooh and ah and laugh, and I'd have a thrill in the process. Except, all of you that have been skiing, listening, you know it didn't go like that. Anyone who had been skiing would have known that. So all of my friends 
watching me go up the lift that had been skiing, they're just shaking their heads inside. They knew, right? That's an awful place to be, though, isn't it, when you don't know what you don't know? Because that's where I was. I didn't know how much I didn't know. So I started down the slope. I started going really fast, very quickly. And I realized real fast why people learn the snowplow thing. It's for control something that I had none of at that point. So I'm going past everyone so fast, I hear wind wisps as I go past them, and realizing I have no way to slow myself down or to control the path that I'm taking. Finally, about three quarters of the way down, I simply lost whatever remainder of control I had, and I wrecked in a violent tumbling ball, taking out myself, families, children, many other skiers who had made better decisions than I had. And then people behind me would crash into me. I was causing one of those highway pileups on a snowy freeway. There was even this one couple. They were were like professional-looking skiers, and they were yelling at me in German. Now, (laughs) German is a harsh language. I mean, even when you're getting complimented, it sounds like you're in trouble. Anyway, I was sore. I felt horrible for being so inconsiderate to others. I was embarrassed. It was awful. I was awful. Imagine, though, imagine being that inept at something, but actually thinking you were ept. Is that a word? Thinking that you were just fine, that there was nothing you needed to learn. Imagine me having gone through that experience and getting up from that awful wreck and thinking I had nothing to learn. See, as a general rule, if we're bad at something, usually we have some awareness. We know we're bad. I know I'm bad at skiing, and I have some colorful memories from that day as a reminder. But it turns out that there's one area of life where people can be really, really, let's just call it suboptimal, but they don't know it. We're so deceived that we think we're doing great. And it actually has to do with our our moral and character development, our standing before God. Maybe you don't necessarily think of yourself as a really religious or really spiritual person. I don't know. Maybe you do. But every one of us, has a tendency to look down on other people to think we're superior to others because of our ideology or our worldview or our experience or education or status or whatever it is. We all have that tendency, religious or not. It's very human. We all struggle with this. But again, the church here, this is a place where no one's perfect and we need to be able to admit that. And I think God may want to do a little surgery around that reality today in our parable for this morning. See, Jesus is going to talk about this because it's a human problem. It's a chronic problem that we have, especially for religious people, for people of faith. Because when we start trying to follow God, we end up starting to think, well, I'm doing better than those people that aren't trying to follow God, that aren't walking in faith. That's our parable this morning. It's found in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Look right away at how it starts at the beginning. Verse 9 says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Right at the beginning, we learn about the audience. They think they're doing well spiritually. They think they're doing better than other people, which, of course, means they're deceived. In Jesus' eyes, they're doing horrible but they don't know it. They don't know what they don't know. So they're going to get a real edgy talk in this parable. This isn't going to be one of those talks where, where the people go up to Jesus afterwards and they're like, Pastor, that was great. Can I, can I get a download of that? Are you going to post that on a podcast? Because I want to hear that one again. It's not going to be that kind of a talk for them. Here's the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Everybody in that crowd knows something right away. They know that the hero of the story is going to be the Pharisee because he's the really good guy. He's respected. He's really devout. He does all the right stuff. That was just a known thing culturally. The bad guy is going to be the tax collector. Tax collectors were kind of story code language for universal hated bad guy. So they collaborated with the oppressive Roman government. They were known to be corrupt, to be above the law, to make their big dollars on the backs of the hardworking families and the disadvantaged. They were cheaters. They were hated. So everybody hears this, and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 we get this. Pharisee's going to be the good guy. Tax collector's going to be the bad guy. What do we need to know? Tell us. 
But the odd thing in how Jesus frames up this parable is that there's a tax collector who's going to pray to God. Well, if he's going to pray, why in the world would he go to the temple, to God's house, with all those devout people around him to do it? That's the curious framing of the story. We'll get back to that. Let's keep on with the story. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. These verses are loaded with details that the crowd gathered would have all understood, okay? The Pharisee stood by himself because he didn't want to get contaminated. In that day, to be ceremonially clean was seen as an expression of devotion to God, all right? If you touched somebody who wasn't clean, like a Gentile, a leprous person, a woman, a sinner, a tax collector, that would make you ceremonially unclean. So distancing yourself from them was thought to be a way that you could proclaim your devotion to God in these Pharisee circles. So this Pharisee distances himself from other people. He says, thank God I'm not like that. Thank you, God, that I'm not like that tax collector over there. And then immediately his prayer becomes a a proclamation of all of his self-assessed goodness. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Here's some, some, some backstory. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to fast only one day a year. That's the Day of Atonement. This guy fasted twice a week. That's 104 days a year. That's 103 days of extra credit, okay? He's like a religious overachiever. And then he says, I give a tenth of all I get. Tithing, which means giving tenth, that was a big deal in the Old Testament. It actually was a pretty complex system, believe it or not. There would be a lot of rabbis who would discuss things like, do you have to tithe on the products where the farmer has already tithed? It's kind of like our our tax system. A lot of levels, a lot of of kind of loopholes, a lot of of complexities within it, okay? So this guy, though, he voluntarily takes no deductions, all right? He's looking for no ways to try to give less. He's like a flat-rate voluntary tither, all right? He would be pleased to have his tithe returns publicly released, all right? He's that guy. He's proud of all this, and the people would look at it and say, yeah, he sets the bar really high. He's that guy. Again, you you may or may not be religious, okay? You may think about your political ideology or your culture of values or whatever it is, but all of us have a way of saying, I know that I'm better than those guys because look at how I do X, Y, and Z. We all have ways that we do that, okay? So this is universal. You can translate into whatever you need to for your own heart, your own circumstance. That's the Pharisee in our story. Then there's the other guy, the tax collector. By contrast, he is a righteousness loser. He's a misfit. He's a failure. Let's continue. Verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. See, the tax collector, he also separates himself. But with him, it's not because he looks down on people. It's because he feels like he has no business being there. He knows he has messed up his life so royally, and he feels like his only hope is to beg for mercy and see if God might spare him. That's the attitude he comes from. And this bears so heavily on him that Jesus says he won't even lift his eyes to heaven. There's something inside of us that when we feel really guilty, we don't want to make eye contact with the person that we've wronged. You ever notice that? If I've lied to you, I have a hard time making eye contact with you because it's painful. It's so deep. It's even true with dogs. You ever notice this? Did you ever notice that dogs, when they're guilty, when they get caught in something, they won't make eye contact with you most of the time? We have two dogs. We got them both from a Great Dane rescue, okay? One is a full-blooded Great Dane. The other one is a half Great Dane, half pointer. When they are guilty, when they are caught doing something, it's, it's difficult to keep yelling at them because they look hilarious. It's just how it is. Well, in our old house, I remember this time I came home from work, and one of my kids' stuffed animals or something, they had managed to get from its space that it was hidden in, and they absolutely tore it to shreds. It was all over the living room carpet. And I came home, and there was, there was a large crate that was off to the side that they would go in to sleep and whatever. 
um, that, that the one Dane barely fit in, by the way. But there was this crate over there, and I came home, and all I started doing was I gr- went down and got a piece. What is this? You know that? And here's a picture. This is what they did. They both, they both tripped over themselves to get into the crate. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I couldn't keep yelling. I just was laughing. Neither of them could make direct eye contact with me. No matter how much I got down in their face, they couldn't do it. Dogs have such a tender conscience. Now, cats, sometimes cats don't look you in the eye, but it's because they're thinking up ways to kill you. (laughs) The tax collector, it says, he wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast. All right, more context here. Beating the breast was an extreme expression of remorse and anger. It was considered such an expression of humiliation or sorrow that men generally were too dignified to do it. But that's what this tax collector does. And then he prays. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But then comes the twist that nobody listening to this story ever would have seen coming. Jesus says, excuse me, in verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Everyone's jaw hits the floor. The tax collector? Dude, that's language for the bad guy. What are you doing? These people all knew what society's code was, what it said to be a good person. Again, all of us, every human, whether we're religious or not, We all think that we more or less know what it means to be a good person. We know there's bad people. We all have some sort of of framework for that. And the good people that we define, usually we end up putting ourselves in that group. That's how we define it. Let's do a little righteousness audit in our story for a minute for these characters. Back in that day, if you would think about the Pharisee and the tax collector and the way they would measure up, culturally speaking, in that religious community, let's see who comes out on top, okay? Let's go through a few areas, all right? First one, who do we think read the scriptures more regularly? Well, that's the Pharisee, obviously. Who prayed more often? That's the Pharisee. Who knew biblical doctrine more clearly? Definitely the Pharisee. He would have studied it down, down to the littlest detail. Who had a better spiritual reputation? For sure, the Pharisee. How about this? Who went to church, or I guess in this case, synagogue, temple, whatever? Who went to church more often? The Pharisee. It looks like a pretty stacked deck here. I mean, even going a little further, if you did some self-assessment and you asked the Pharisee and the tax collector and you said to them, which of the two of you loves God with everything in you? Which one would say, me, me, me? It's going to be the Pharisee. But we got one more category, just one more. Which of the two of them was more aware of their desperate need for God? Now that's the tax collector. God, I desperately need you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus calls that attitude of public confession and our desperate need for him, he calls that humility. No pretending, no hiding. And apparently, this category, where we are on this scale, is a pretty important one because it single-handedly tipped the scales in the tax collector's favor in this story. Humility and honesty before God. <clears throat> There's a phrase that's been around for a while now. It refers for when people are humble and honest. Called being real, keeping it real. We've all heard that. It's the idea that says, don't pretend to be what you're not. Don't pretend that you've got it all together. Don't pretend you don't have weaknesses or problems. Lose the image management. Just be honest with who you are honest with your true motives. Just be real. And Jesus speaks right into our humanity on this. And he says, he says, listen, I'm starting a new kind of community. And it's going to be a place where everyone is welcome. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, everyone. No more us and them. No more Pharisee and tax collector. Bad guy, good guy. It's no more those who have it together and those who don't. Everyone is imperfect and everyone is welcome. And like I said at the beginning, that's who we aim to be here at NHCC. Now, just an aside here. You heard Katie mention this in the the announcement time. The meetings for our vote and our updated bylaws. You heard her mention that. Most of you got an email this week about that. 
And it's an important step in our church where the members of this church vote on some structural things for our future, okay? That might have a few of you wondering, well, am, I think I'm a member. Am I a, am I a member? How does that even work with this church? How does membership work? Well, as far as how it works, I'll get to that in a bit. But for now, I do want to let everybody know, as an aside, that because we have this voting responsibility coming up, we want to make sure we have our records straight, okay? There's been a lot of lists and spreadsheets and databases and church directories and all sorts of things over many years, and people and computers are not without their problems. So after church today and next week, there's going to be a couple of elders out there in the lobby with clipboards and with some lists, all right? What we did is we did our absolute best to try to pull together all of the resources we could get our hands on and some of the records to get lists of members and attendees and figure out kind of what's what. So sometime in these next two weeks, would you check in with one of them on your way out and make sure we have our records straight, see if there's any discrepancies that we need to address, okay? So that we can have our members voting on the 18th. And we don't have anyone showing up and saying, wait a minute, I thought I could vote. So let's, let's just work and get that the best we can, okay? So if you think that's you, stop by the guys with the clipboards after service today, all right? If you're not sure, check with them anyway. All of us here, though, we're a community of imperfect people and imperfect record keeping and whatever else you want to assign to the word imperfect. Just keeping it real, okay? All right, here's what that means, keeping it real. It means here at this place that nobody can come pretending. Nobody should come acting like, yeah, I, I got it all together. I don't have any real needs or problems. Or related to that, nobody should be coming here to play church face on Sunday morning to try to keep their non-Sunday lives boxed away for different people to see. Because that's a false you. We need to be real. That's what we're talking about here. We are all messy people in need of God. And we must be a community where we are courageous enough to admit that. Okay? To be honest, to be humble, because without that, there is no real community. Community built on pretending and keeping up appearances and managing faces is not community at all. So the number one rule is this in this community, the number one commandment is thou shalt keep it real. All right? I actually think that's part of why the tax collector goes to the temple. Remember how I said that was kind of an odd way to frame up that story? A tax collector going to a temple to pray? Why would he voluntarily do that? Why would he voluntarily put himself in the middle of an environment of potential scorn and judgment. Why would he do that? Listen, I need to tell you something. When people get real, when they go in front of others and in front of God and acknowledge, this is who I really am. God, I desperately need you. I am weak. I have mess-ups. When people do that, there is incredible freedom that comes from not having to hide or pretend anymore. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've experienced that. It's because healing comes, healing begins when you are known. When you step into light, that's how that happens. Sickness stays and sickness grows when it hides in the shadows. But we live in a world where, where we're taught to hide so reflexively, so instinctively, taught to hide our, our weaknesses that we don't even know we're doing it. In the world around us, if you want people to welcome you, well, our world is for winners, for conquerors, for succeeders, right? If you want to be welcomed by our world, you need to convince people that you're as, as rich as Warren Buffett, as smart as Albert Einstein, as strong as Andre the Giant, and as sexy as Adam Levine. I don't know. And we get so used to hiding and pretending, pretending that we're closer to looking like winners than losers. It's so powerful that we don't realize we're doing it. But time and again, Jesus speaks out against that tendency. Jesus starts this community where you can be as strong as Warren Buffett, as smart as Andre the Giant, and as sexy as Albert Einstein. And Jesus says, come on in, you're one of us here. It's for the broken. It's for the sinners. It's for people who have been humbled because they recognize their enormous need for God. The losers are the winners. The weak are the strong. The humbled are exalted. And death dies and is defeated by life. That's the incredible community that Jesus started. And it's who we need to be at this church. But listen, 
For our church to be that kind of a place, to be that kind of a community, we have to face head on the turning point in this story, the hinge, the key. And it's when that loser, that misfit, the bad guy, the tax collector just gets brutally real, gets sorrowful and honest, and says from his heart, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When we truly do that, when we are humble, when we are honest, When we get real, what we're really saying is, I've been following my way up to this point, and my way is no good. God, I have to surrender and follow your way. And we step into the honesty of this new community. And the idea now is that this is going to be a place where we're going to keep it real from now on, because it's only when you're really known that you can be really loved. Where we meet on this common ground at the foot of the cross. In, uh, in addiction recovery groups, like AA meetings, we find those moments, right? Anytime someone says, my name is John, I'm an alcoholic. Everybody says, hi, John. It's a way of welcoming and embracing that person. They're not celebrating alcoholism. They all know the damage that can do. What's being celebrated is that someone has come to a place where they have recognized and publicly confessed. I have problems. I can't do this alone. I need help. And then there's celebrating. Sometimes it has taken people years and decades of literal and absolute hell to get to that place. But here's the thing. It is so life-giving and freeing that every time somebody says that, takes that step, the people in that community celebrate. They say, you are welcome here. And they connect. They meet on that common ground of brokenness. In our parable, parable today, there's this tax collector. And he's at the end of his rope. He's in a pit of his own mess. And he cries out from that pit. And his cries were the cries of all of us, right? I'm stuck. I'm overwhelmed. I've made a mess. God have mercy. And hearing those cries are good, righteous, superior people way up high looking down into the pit. Maybe some of them feel bad, feel pity on him. Maybe they try and offer him a half of their sandwich. I don't know. But frankly, they're mostly pretty glad that they're not the ones down there. But then there's Jesus. And he gets a ladder and he descends down into the pit. He comes to be with us. I know what it's like down here, he says. You're not alone. Across global religions, there is no story of a God quite like Jesus. That's why he makes this a whole different community. The people who follow him loved him. They were filled with such wonder they could hardly find the words to talk about it, to express it. Look at this from one of the writers in the New Testament. They say this in in Hebrews. They say, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Time of need. Well, when is that? Uh, When do we not need him? In our time of need, Jesus comes down right into our pit, right into our darkness, our sin, into our guilt. He says, you're not alone. Because he knows that only when you're being really you, and I mean really, honestly you, no pretending, no hiding, only when you're being you can you be really loved. He starts this community. Church, we've got to keep being that community. It's countercultural. It's counterintuitive, but it's worth fighting for. Because Jesus loved people. End of sentence. No conditions. No one had ever seen a rabbi that would love the kind of people Jesus would love. Criminals, swindlers, prostitutes for crying out loud. He would love the Roman centurions everyone hated. He would love Gentiles. He would love Samaritans. He would love lepers. He would touch them. He would love tax collectors. And it wasn't in some sort of pity party way. He climbed the ladder down with them. And it made a huge buzz with everyone because in doing so, he was climbing down that ladder to all of us. So we're going to do something a little different this morning. 
we're going to kind of practice being real together, okay? Being real before God, being real before one another. So I'm going to invite you to do something, and it might challenge some of you out of your comfort zones a bit. We're going to have a time of invitation, and I want to explain a little bit here, okay? I want to be clear. Many of you know that we have an invitation time at the end of every service, a time for anyone that might be prompted to respond in some way, maybe take the step of baptism, and in so doing, proclaiming Jesus as our Lord and Savior, maybe come forward to place membership here. We try to make membership a pretty simple process. See, in the New Testament church, we try to kind of pattern that. If you come forward, you proclaim Jesus as your Savior, and you're baptized, you're, you're a member. But if you've already taken that step of baptism somewhere else, you just come and you affirm that Jesus is your Lord. The way it works is you come forward and we all say together, all of us, what Peter says to Jesus when he says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. We say that along with you. That's it. That's how it works. That may be familiar to many of you that have been coming a while. And those things are absolutely going to be an open invitation for this morning. But I also want to do something else. It's that something different that I mentioned. And it's what we talked about today. It's about getting real. We're going to sing a final song together. And I'm going to invite, as we sing, I'm going to invite anyone who is willing to lay it raw and to simply get real before God and before each other here. I want to invite you to be like that tax collector. To be willing to step out in a public environment and cry out to God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. See, like we said, there's this freedom. There's this powerful thing that happens in community when someone is willing to do that. And I'm going to be honest here. I'm kind of tired at it of it only happening at AA meetings and at addiction recovery groups. Those shouldn't be the only places where a community can get real and raw and can confess and admit weaknesses and then come together and link arms and celebrate together. This is church. If it can't happen here, we have problems, folks. So wherever it is that you need God's mercy, I challenge you to get real and step out into this community this morning. Maybe, maybe you're addicted to something. Maybe you're an alcoholic, and maybe you've even said that in some other communities, some other places, but never at church. And you just need to say, God, I'm someone whose life is a royal mess apart from you. I don't have it together, and I need your mercy. Maybe your marriage got train wrecked, and you know it was largely your fault. Maybe you betrayed somebody. God's mercy is greater than that. There's forgiveness. Maybe you've been carrying around resentment and anger and you just live with guilt and bitterness. And God is just saying, if you just come and get real with me, I'll give you grace. Maybe for you there's been a spirit of judgmentalism or superiority. Maybe when you encounter someone that has different views from you, you think, ah, too bad for you. I'm better than you. I got it right. God is saying, would you just humble yourself and be honest about this? Maybe you've stolen stuff. Maybe you've been in jail. Maybe your career looks great, but you've been selfish. You've been so devoted to yourself. Nobody else knows it because you manage it well, but you know it. Maybe you've just whiffed it on your relationship with your kids. Whatever it is, I don't need to make a longer list. In this community where nobody is perfect, this is, this, this is the place for that. This is the community of keeping it real. There is mercy, grace, and forgiveness available to all of us. So, I'm going to invite you to get real before God, to pray and pour out your heart to Him in some tangible way this morning. I just want to open this up to some possibilities, okay? During during the song that we sing, maybe for you it's simply kneeling in the pew where you're sitting. Maybe it's standing where you are and raising your hands as an act of submission to God. Maybe it's coming forward and kneeling up by these steps here. Maybe it's coming forward and sitting in one of the front pews. Maybe it's standing up off to the side. Whatever it is for you, my invitation is to get out of your comfy spot of sitting in a seat and be willing to step into a physically tangible expression in front of a room of other imperfect people, people who need mercy just as much as you do. We can link arms in our brokenness. That is my challenge. That is my invitation. I'll be up here. Another elder will be up here with me for anyone who may 
specifically be ready for like a step of baptism or membership with the church or need to very specifically pray about something. But for most of you, your challenge is to just step into a physically tangible way to get real with God, to do business with him in this ragtag community of misfits here. So whether it's kneeling in a pew, whether it's coming forward and finding some posture up here, I'm going to invite you to do business with God. And I want to be clear, okay? This is about sin. This is about struggle, about weakness, about pain and difficulty. This is a bold move, okay? This isn't just, okay, we're all going to pray for traveling mercies and a coworker who's sick. That's not what this is about. Those are fine things, but that's not what this is about right now. This is plain and simple, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God, I've made some messes. I've leaned too hard on my own way. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what this is about. It may not be for everyone. I don't want you forcing yourself to participate in this because you think you're supposed to. Be real. Be honest. I know it's for some of us, maybe for plenty of us. If that's a conversation you need to have with God, then I challenge you to get real, to step into that this morning. Let's do this together, okay? I'm going to pray to start us off, to ask God to move in our hearts, and then we're going to sing the song, Here I Am to Worship Together, just remaining seated. And throughout the whole time of the song, let's just jump in. Let's step out and get real with God, however that looks for you. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's pray and then let's do that as we sing. Heavenly Father, we're the failures. We're the messed ups, the sinners, the guilt ridden. We're the anxious. We're the fearful. We're the greedy. We're the self obsessed. We're the betrayers. We're the resentful. God, we love you. We're so grateful for Jesus. God, we're asking you this morning to pour out mercy on us now. God, have mercy on me, Ethan Harrington, a sinner. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's step out and get real as we do this together and as we sing.